This is the second part of Economics for Business, Lecture 9, which considers the quantity theory of credit. So we'll be looking at the quantity theory of credit in relation to the insights it provides into what are the economic consequences of different types of bank lending. And the theory proposes that the sector allocated lending by financial institutions is important in determining the impact of that lending. And we can see from the data from the Bank of England in relation to lending by financial institutions in 2018 that 49.5% of total lending by financial institutions was for the purchase of property. 7.7% uh, was for consumer credit, 4.3% student loans, 23% of lending was to other financial institutions, and 14.5% of lending was to private non-financial corporations. Now, a corporation is a business that has been given a separate legal identity. Um, it will have a memorandum of association, articles of association. It can conduct contracts in its own name. Um, examples are private limited companies that will go by the will have the limited uh, suffix after their name, and also public limited companies, which will have PLC after their name. Now the, uh, they are in the private sector, hence private corporations and they are not financial, so they are non-financial corporations. They're not involved in the financial sector. So lending to private non-financial corporations is approximately 14.5%. With unincorporated businesses, these are businesses that don't have a separate legal identity uh, from their owners, such as sole trades and partnerships, account for approximately 1% of total lending by financial institutions. So lending to non-financial businesses, both corporate and unincorporated businesses, is only 15.5% of total lending in the UK economy, which caused Steve Keane to say that lending for speculation on real estate has become the main function of the private banking sector. And we can see from this chart which shows in the pink area uh, lending for property purchase. In relation to the blue line, which is GDP, we can see that lending on property has not only become the main form of lending by UK financial institutions, but it has also increased substantially over the period 1993 to 2018. So, for example, in 1993, lending for property was only 346 billion, whereas by 2018, lending for property had increased to almost 1.4 trillion. So it had increased by a trillion pounds over the period 1993 to 2018. Uh, consumer credits in the same period increased from 51 billion. Uh, to 215 billion, so a fourfold increase, but nothing like um, the one trillion increase in lending for property. And we will see that lending to private non financial corporations uh, only doubled over the period 1998 to 2018, went from 189 billion to 404 billion. Um, lending to unincorporated businesses hardly changed moving from 27 billion to 28 billion over the period 1998 to 2018. So much slower growth in bank lending to business compared to bank lending for property purchase and consumer credit. So we'll look at, first of all, what the quantity theory of credit says uh, the insights it provides in relation to lending for GDP transactions. And the quantity theory of credit proposes that bank lending for business investment to private non-financial corporations and unincorporated businesses encourages growth in economic activity. This is because when businesses lend money, that leads to investment 
uh, in new productive capacity, then enabling them to increase the output of goods and services that increases GDP in the economy. And that growth in output suppresses inflationary pressures um, due to the increased production of goods and services. And not only does it suppress inflation, but it also raises incomes in the economy as value added by businesses increases as a consequence of business investment. So there's more money to be shared between the various facts of production, land, labour, capital and enterprise, that contribute to the production of that output. Um, so lending for productive investment creates added value. The businesses create additional value that they can then use to repay the capital on the loans that, that they've made and also the interest. And that extra value reduces the risk of banking crises. Um, however, only 15.5% of lending by UK financial institutions is directed towards non-financial businesses, uh, both corporate and unincorporated. The other type of lending for GDP transactions is lending for consumer borrowing. Now, the quantity theory of credit proposes that this creates new consumer purchasing power, which may encourage firms to increase output as a consequence of the additional demand in the economy. But initially, it is also likely to increase the rate of consumer price inflation, as output is fairly fixed and so a significant increase in consumer demand causes firms to be unable to meet the demand for products that there is. And the way that companies ration demand in that situation is by raising price. So you tend to get consumer price inflation if there is significant additional demand for products that producers are unable to meet. The second point is that consumer borrowing transfers future purchasing power into the current period, which means that consumers have more money now when they borrow the money. However, in the future, their purchasing power, the consumer's purchasing power will be reduced as they need to repay both the capital and interest on their outstanding debts. And so it can create risks for an economy, excessive lending, um, in relation to the future because people will have less purchasing power in the future as a consequence of bringing their purchasing power forward into the present period. Approximately 8% of lending by UK financial institutions is associated with consumer borrowing. So overall, we can say that total lending for GDP transactions is about 24% of total lending by UK financial institutions. Um, 15.5% of lending to business for business investment, 8% of lending for consumer borrowing. The quantity theory of credit then considers the impact of financial institutions allocating credit money for non-GDP transactions. And it proposes that the allocation of credit money for non-GDP non-GDP transactions, which refers to transactions that do not increase gross domestic product, they are not spent on new goods and services, will have no impact on economic growth and will instead promote asset price inflation. And lending in the non-GDP category is, for example, lending for property purchase, which accounts for 50% of total lending by financial institutions and lending to other financial institutions to purchase property and financial assets is approximately 23% of total lending. Which caused Adair Turner, in his 2016 book Between Debt and the Devil, to state that the vast majority of bank lending in advanced economies does not support new business investment, but instead funds either increased consumption or the purchase of already existing assets, in particular real estate. Real estate is a relatively fixed in supply and consequently the transfer of funds to this sector leads to asset price increases that induce yet more credit demand and more credit supply.
which is at the core of financial instability in modern economies. These self-reinforcing credit and asset price cycles are the inevitable result. Richard Werner then goes on to refer to Say's law of bank credit creation. Uh, the original Say's law says that supply creates its own demand. Um, when more goods are produced, that creates additional incomes that lead to more demand for products. Uh, Richard Werner uh, related Say's law to bank credit creation, the idea that increasing the supply of credit money for property purchase increases demand for property purchase. And the reason being that when, when banks create new bank deposits, they create new credit money that leads to new purchasing power that did not previously exist. Then this additional purchasing power increases demand for assets, both property and financial assets, which are relatively fixed in supply. When you create additional demand for assets that are relatively fixed in supply, then what tends to happen is the prices of those assets increase in order to ration demand. And so what then happens is rising asset prices are recognised by investors who want to make speculative gains from those increasing asset prices. And so there's a greater demand to borrow money from the banks to fund the uh, purchase of uh, assets, both property and financial assets, um, as a consequence of speculators wanting to make a speculative gain from rising asset prices. And we can see here what has happened to average UK house prices between 1970 and 2018. That in 1970, the average house price was £5,000. Um, and it grew steadily up to 1997 before the growth in prices rapidly in started to increase, such that now the average house price in, two th well, in 2018, the average house price was almost £300,000. This growth in house prices has increased house prices in relation to earnings. For most of the 60s and 1970s, building societies worked on the rule of thumb that people could receive a mortgage which was equivalent to three times their earnings. Um, in 1997, the average, the median English house price was only three and a half times annual earnings. But by 2018, the ha average house price had increased to eight times median annual earnings. So a very substantial increase in house prices relative to the uh, individual earnings. And we can see that in, that graph, in, in this graph. The other type of lending for non-GDP transactions is bank lending to other financial institutions, um, such as hedge funds, stockbrokers, who can use the money for purchasing property and financial assets, such as company shares and corporate and government bonds. We can see that there's been a significant growth in financial asset prices since the mid-1990s. Uh, according to the FTSE 100 share index. Um, this significant growth in asset prices has been partly driven by borrowed money, investors borrowing money to buy assets. The motivation to borrow money is that borrowed money provides leverage. It enables you to make a greater potential gain with any available funds because you're adding to your own funds the money you've been able to borrow to increase the overall gain from any growth in share prices. And so we've seen an increasing amount of credit being allocated to financial markets, and that has helped to drive up share prices. However, one of the risks with a lot of leverage 
in financial markets is that when people are heavily borrowed, they can't afford for share prices in their portfolio to fall significantly because not only does leverage increase the potential gains from asset price rises, but it also massively magnifies the consequence of any share price falls. And so when investors that are highly leveraged see falling share prices, they will tend to offload their shares to avoid significant financial losses. And we've seen that in the recent experience in March 2020 with the coronavirus, where share prices have fallen significantly. And one of the reasons for that will be highly leveraged investors looking to minimise their losses as a consequence of falling share prices. Um, so the issue with credit money being allocated for non-GDP transactions is that the ability of the borrower to repay the debt is a consequence of a future purchaser being prepared to pay more for the asset than the original asset purchaser paid originally. Um, and when asset prices are at historically high levels, this is referred to as the greater fool theory because you're reliant on somebody being prepared to pay an even higher price than you when you paid a price that was significantly above the historic uh, mean uh, for the asset, the historic mean price. So uh, when you're borrowing money for speculation, um, you will only be able to repay the debt if the asset rises in price uh, relative to what you paid for it and not only covers the repayment of your initial capital but also the interest that you have incurred since purchasing the asset. And so the risk of asset prices falling creates significant risks um, for the financial sector and significant risk of instability because if the people that have borrowed for speculative purposes find that the asset prices have fallen relative to the amount they borrowed and are consequently in a situation of negative equity, they are likely to walk away from their debts, leave them with the banks as non-performing loans. And then if the non-performing loans are sufficiently large in relation to the bank's liabilities to people that have deposited money with the bank, then the banks become insolvent. So this is a real risk to the financial sector. And Reinhardt and Rogoff in two, their 2009 book ref, referred to, said, suggested that banking crises tend to follow a period of rapid increases in asset prices because banks have become increasingly reliant on speculators borrowing money and when those speculators then go into negative equity, they walk away from their debts. And ultimately, if those non-performing loans are sufficiently large in relation to a bank's total assets, then the banks fail. And you can get in financial markets a Minsky moment, which refers to a sudden fall in asset prices following the excessive use of credit to purchase assets. And that is what we may have seen recently with share prices in March 2020, following investors' concerns about the coronavirus um, issue. So increased borrowing for the purpose of purchasing property and financial assets risks creating a Minsky moment. Some uh, look at the growth of credit money as an example of financialization. Financialization refers to the increasing dominance of the economy, politics and economic policy by financial interests and financial institutions. Uh, Thomas Pally, uh, which I've hyperlinked his article uh, in, in these slides, discusses financial financialization. Uh, financialization refers to an increase in the size and importance of the country's financial sector 
relative to its overall economy as it gets political and economic policy to be increasingly subservient to its own interests. And consequent, a consequence of financialization is that the financial sector becomes increasingly wealthy and acquires an increasing proportion of the nation's output. So that is the end of Lecture 9.